Welcome to the Tallahassee International Airport. Although our airport is small, we have a really cool opportunity today to take a behind the scenes look on how we get all those planes in and out of the runway safe and how it affects our weather balloons that we're sending off today. Let's go take a look. as well. Thanks for coming out. What are we going to be doing today and seeing here at the airport? Well, we're going to take a look at safety, uh, predominantly safety issues and things like that. We can take a look at the ARF station, which is the firefighters here, um, that provide a safe environment for aircraft to operate in. And we can go out and take a look at the runways and the taxiways, talk about some of the aviation specific markings and uh, some of the safety areas and things like that. Let's go take a look. Well, a NOTAM stands for Notice to Airmen. Okay. And the NOTAM is um, a communication vehicle for um, the, the NAS, the National Airspace System. Okay. What that does is if we have any type of a condition going on here at the airport that um, pilots need to be aware of, we'll issue that NOTAM. What that does, it goes out on a system nationwide. Mm -hmm. So anybody ta traveling to Tallahassee International Airport, they'll pull up NOTAMs and they'll take a look at it and they'll say, oh look, they've got this going on. So for example, if we had, let's say an air show going on, mm -hmm. we would issue a NOTAM to show that we've got an air show going on. Okay. And as they're flying in, they know to expect a lot of aircraft, maybe high performance aircraft and things of that nature. So um, if we've got any conditions that they need to know know about from a safety standpoint, we'll do the same thing. Okay. And it's just a way to communicate with inbound pilot. Um, so when we call in our NOTAM mm -hmm. from Buck Lake Elementary School, yes. To let you guys know that we'll be releasing weather balloons on May 19th at 9 a.m. What is that? What do you guys do on your part? Well, the airport won't do anything with that, but okay. the tower will. What okay. the tower will do is they'll pinpoint where Buck Lake Elementary School is, and they've got it on their radar out there. They'll they'll say it's in this vicinity here. And at that point, all the controllers that are dealing with any inbound, outbound, or transient aircraft will talk to them and tell them to use caution that there's a weather balloon. It could be a catastrophic result of an aircraft collided with one of those things. Um, jet engines are like huge vacuum cleaners. Okay. So if there's any debris on the taxiways or on the runways or anything of that nature, it'll suck it right up into the engine. Depending on the nature of the debris, it can, what we refer to as, fod out the engine, which means it doesn't work anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so that's not a good thing. Mm -hmm. So um, that's the main thing, is just from an aviation safety standpoint, when that NOTAM goes out, that gives these guys the heads up to where they can report that to any inbound or outbound aircraft so they can be on the lookout for okay. it. NOTAM stands for Notice to Airmen. We have to issue a NOTAM to make sure that everyone stays safe. Issuing a NOTAM lets air traffic control know what will be in the skies that day. Air traffic control lets pilots know weather balloons will be in the sky. This helps keep planes away from the weather balloons and helps keep everybody safe. We'll head on down to the ARF station okay. <coughs> and meet the guys down there. Um, what does that stand for, ARF? Uh, aircraft Rescue and Firefighting. Okay. And <coughs> a commercial airport has to have ARF coverage anytime you have commercial arrivals and departures going on. Um, 
here at Tallahassee International Airport, we have three firefighters and three trucks manned 24-7. Oh, wow. They work the same thing as the city guys do, and they are city firefighters, but okay. they have special certifications <clears throat> in order to work here. And what, what they will do is they'll come in usually at 6 o'clock in the evening, and they don't get off until mm -hmm. 6 o'clock the following evening. So they work 24 hours on, and then they're 48 yes, hours off. Um, <clears throat> Tallahassee is what the FAA considers yeah. an Index C facility. That's determined on the average number of daily departures and the length of the largest aircraft you have coming in here. Okay. So what Index C means is we have to have at least two vehicles and we have to have the capability to deploy at least 3,000 gallons of water. Okay. We actually go above and beyond that. We have three vehicles and two of the three vehicles carry 3,000 gallons of water all by themselves along with AFFF, which is um, uh, foam, mm -hmm. and they also have dry chemical. Okay. Um, then we've also got a new vehicle that we're going to get in about a month uh, to replace one that is here. It's a rapid intervention vehicle, and that's the one that the lieutenant normally drives, and he's a little bit smaller and, as a result, a little bit more maneuverable and can get to any emergencies more quickly. The Tallahassee International Airport is a Category C airport. This is determined by the number of arrivals and departures, as well as the largest airplane that enters the airport. In a Category C airport, they must have at least two vehicles and must be able to deploy at least 3,000 gallons of water. The three materials that Tallahassee International Airport's ARF vehicles carry are water, foam, and dry chemicals. Two of the three vehicles at Tallahassee International Airport carry 3,000 gallons of water, AFFF, which is foam, and Purple K, which is dry chemicals. Um, but uh, but no, really, they, they do an outstanding job. They're always training. If they see an aircraft taxi in here that they're not familiar with, they'll go out and they'll talk to the pilot about it. They'll find out where all the critical areas are. They want to know where the batteries are in case they have to disconnect one. Um, military aircraft, they have to be careful where the ejection uh, the side of the of the cockpit is, okay. um, things of that nature. And they'll they'll find out where all these different parts of the aircraft are that they may have to be forced to deal with um, at, at some point. Um, they're constantly training. But one of the things that they uh, have to be able to do in the beginning of next month, we'll, we'll have our annual safety inspection by the FAA okay. as far as airport certification. Um, if we don't pass that certification, we don't get commercial arrivals and departures. One of the things that these guys have to do is they will, ha they will conduct a drill and in that drill, the tower will actually ring them down. It will actually hit the emergency horn that means a crash has occurred. These guys, from the time that horn goes off, um, have to get in their gear, get in the vehicle, get out to the airfield, make contact with the tower, get permission to gain access to the airfield because mm -hmm. even though it's an emergency, they still have to be in contact with the tower. And they have to respond to the midpoint of the farthest runway, which is probably a mile and a half away. Okay. The first vehicle has to start deploying water within three minutes. Wow. So it's very stringent and it's impressive to watch. service is like very very compartmentalized and has different certifications and you start off as a rookie firefighter and you get put into the fire station downtown and from there you learn the basic firefighting job and then as you get more and more experience and you get more seniority 
they allow you to take other classes. You can do USAR, you can do uh, hazmat, hazardous materials response, and then the airport. There's no rookie firefighters here at this airport. We'll at least have a, at least 15 years in service. So, and so, uh, yeah, you, you first start off learning in town how to put out your regular fires, and then you're going to regular medical routine, medical medical emergencies, and then you kind of progress through the ladder and go to different specialized stations. And this is one of them. So, like, um, we're only three of maybe five that are on the shift okay. out of 75 firefighters that are trained okay. on this particular shift so that can work here. So, um, we have to follow all the FA um, guidelines, um, and then we have to do the training, and then every year we get tested. And then the inspector comes here and, from the FAA, and they um, um, test our um, response. And we're about to do that, what, this month? Uh, next month, first next month, we're starting to practice. He was telling us about that. You guys yeah. have three minutes to prepare right. everything and get all the way out there. I told you not to tell him I was bragging. <laughs> 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 so we have a lot to do, and um, it's great. I, I really enjoy it out here. It's a different, and we all talked about this, and it's a little different from what we used to. We were on the street, and now we're, uh, we're ch we change gears, and we're totally in the you know the aerospace aspect of firefighting which is a lot different from because we're dealing with a lot of fuels that we don't deal with out there we deal with houses that catch on fire here we're dealing with <coughs> thousands of gallons of jetty fuel or, or um, different types of fuels and we have a um, uh, a fuel farm out here so we're, we're going from the physical fires where you know houses catch on fires to come on over here where it's more liquid based and okay. I noticed your um, your fire trucks are very different than what our kids might see yeah. on the you know on the road passing by them yeah. they they look quite a bit uh, more high tech looks like something right. you see in a Transformers movie or something right. because the, the fire trucks in town <laughs> fire trucks in town carry water okay which puts fires out but with these trucks, if we just throw water at the fire, it's just going to spread. Yeah. Because we're dealing with fuel fires, plus mm -hmm. with fires. So you need to have foams, and so that's what we bring to the picture is uh, smothering agents, okay. uh, large amounts of foam, large amounts of fire extinguisher. Cool. Because uh, uh, we can't just fight alone with water. Yeah. That's some serious yeah. gear. <laughs> but it, this is what um, typically used at a art facility, okay. air, aircraft rescue, firefighting. That's what we are here. Now, notice how his overalls are pulled down around his boots. Yes. That's so that for the quick response. So okay, he can so step, step into in his boots, and bam, he's got his overalls on. How quick can you guys put on your gear? Well, we have to put the gear on, get in the truck, start it, get it out. Be at the other end of the run, runway shooting water, shooting water, shooting water. Three, three minutes. minutes. So that, what does that tell you? Jump in it. <laughs> should I take my shoes off? Yeah, out? sure. Like I said, this is uh, basically talking about safety. This is the most important part of our job as far as being safe as our gear. You know? um, these are specialized turnout gear. We have other turnout gear we use for uh, structural fire Okay. So this is what you would use in a fuel fire, because we're dealing with high temperatures. And so what this um, aluminized jacket and pants and gloves and everything else, what it does is it reflects a lot of that radiant heat. Okay. And uh, protects us better than structural gear. Okay. If we were in town, and we had to fight a house fire, we would not use this. We would use this type of gear. Okay. And it's a lot heavier. Oh, yeah. It's a lot heavier. And what this does is it, it protects you from the flames. Okay. And this protects you from the radiant heat. Gotcha. It does have some flame protection, but it's mainly used for that high temperatures that we experience with the mm -hmm. uh, flashpoint. So then we have our gloves. And what we do is you can just set this up or you can just he looks like an astronaut. Yeah, it's basically, and it all comes, all this stuff comes from NASA. I mean, all this stuff that they, uh, you know, the, 
Before NASA, we wore leather jackets and rubber jackets, and um, one of the greatest things that came out of NASA is um, the, the fire um, protection gear, because they, um, they also have to worry about um, heat, astronauts. So what we have here is your typical fire department helmet, Covered. That is covered with the uh, the aluminum uh, shroud. It's just like your typical fire helmet, but it's got a little extra protection. Good. I can fight some fires now. Oh, we gotta put the air pack on. I can save some people's lives. <laughs> so what we have here too is uh, how is it we're dealing with high heat, right? Yeah. So we can't breathe high temperature air. Yeah, you gotta. So we gotta bring our own air with us. Is it oxygen? No, this is um, actually it's just um, air. just air. Just because oxygen fluid. is highly flammable. Exactly. Yeah. Put it on, Miss Ike. <laughs> yeah, we don't want to yeah. put. We don't want to go into a burning building or a burning airplane fire with oxygen. No, that'd be bad. You might Yeah. in town. Did you guys help each other put all this on or you do all this by yourself? No, we do this ourselves. <laughs> There's one person in the vehicle. One person in each, in each truck. Yes. Okay. And then of course, this is our mask. You don't you not you don't need to put it on yet. <laughs> I don't think she could at this Basically, time. Basically, <laughs> it's like a scuba diver's mask. Yeah. And it has a microphone that um, it's cool. a actually amplifier, not a microphone, an amplifier. And this is a LED light system that it, it's a smart LED, it's a smart mask. Okay. It talks with the air pack. Um, these air packs are like $10,000 a piece. Wow. They're really neat. They're state of the art. They talk to each other. It lets me know with these little colored LED lights, LED lights, let me know how much air I have. And then uh, when it gets down so far, it'll, it'll alarm and tell me to get out. So, so basically that's that's how what we do. This is what we operate in. Um, me and Steve would actually be in the truck okay. and we would keep the fires off the passengers and try to keep the vapors from the fuel suppressed. Okay. While Chad, the lieutenant, he would be dressed out like you are right now and kind of either going inside and putting the fire out or um, directing the other firefighters that are coming from town. Because if we were to have a large airplane, it would, it would have, there's only three of us. So do all three of you wear this suit or do you guys we wear do. that one and he wears this one? We all three have this set up. Y'all three like space yeah. invaders Big when material. you go and try and help people save their lives. <laughs> Firefighters' overalls are pulled up over their boots for quick response. This way, when they're called out to a fire, they can jump in their boots, pull up their overalls, and head out to their truck. Remember, during training, they only have three minutes to get out on the runway and begin snuffing out that fire. I'd want a quick response as well if I was stuck in a fire. Firefighters have incorporated a lot of different NASA technologies into their daily lives. Their suits with the aluminum covering, like the ones astronauts use, help protect them from the hot radiation of an intense fire. The Velcro on their suits also came from NASA. Firefighters' air packs are filled with regular old air rather than pure oxygen because oxygen is highly flammable. 
pure oxygen would explode, which would be very bad for all parties. Be real careful climbing up in there, okay? Okay. Therefore, obstacle or gracious enough buying this this awesome truck. I mean, I love it. Wow. I never mean, get to drive it because I'm not that the, uh, the senior guy gets to drive it, so Steve drives it, but the feeling will come in. My truck's at the shop right now. Thanks for it. Go ahead and sit in this truck. Yeah, sit in the driver's seat. Yeah, driver's seat. Now the first thing you'll see is uh it, you sit in the middle, yes. which is really, really weird, right? That's very strange. Um, and it's built like an airplane. It, it kind of you got the windscreen just like an airplane. Um, and, uh, we don't have a key, so this is how we turn it on. But everything is made for visibility. Okay. Because a lot of times we're dealing with a huge amount of fire and a lot of smoke and we really don't know where the stuff is at so that's why we have such good visibility in these units um, um, what we have here to here is uh, two joysticks and um, they're just like an airplane um, and what they do is they operate our turns okay so Steve would set up his truck, go as close as he could, and um, we would turn on the, our turret here. That's really cool. And we have one just above it too. You really can't see it. Yeah, I can see it. And we have two, the roof, roof turret, and then uh, uh, go ahead and go back and forth with it. Yeah, this have been firefighters. <laughs> and all these, I mean, it's like a video game. You yeah. press the little button and it's yeah. with spray, I'm assuming. Yeah. Oh. Now go, um, see the button next to the button I just pressed on that? The, this, this one? Yeah. Go ahead and uh, lower it. Go ahead. You won't hurt it. Keep going. You won't hurt it. Oh, this is in wow. case if we have a low engine fire. We can go down and shoot. Uh, oh, yeah. Get down in there. Wow. These little mirrors right here, well, okay, you, you yeah, can, you see can see where the see. nozzle is at. That's awesome. awesome. Now hit the uh, button that's over. This one? The next one. This one? Yep, go ahead and hit that. And what it, that's doing now is it's, it's oscillating. So you'll you see, can it. see it in the mirror. Oh, okay, yeah. It back and forth. So now you can use your roof turret. And this is, <laughs> this is putting out oh, foam. So now you yeah. can use this one to move it around. Right. And so this is taking, it's like a, like a, uh, uh, autopilot. You're, okay. you're shooting, you're squirting foam on the ground and putting that foam on top of that fuel. Mm -hmm. And so it won't like, and then you're using the top one to put the fire out that's on the plane. Okay. okay so, because we're very limited on our manpower, there's only one of us in your truck. Yeah. So I'm in that one, Steve's in that one, and Chad's in that one. Okay. okay. So, so you're he's doing both joysticks right. at the same time. And it's nice that this one's oscillating by itself when you can work. It. So this this truck has the foam. What is your oh, truck? Yeah. Okay. Oh, this one has about three thousand gallons of water. Okay. Which is a lot of water. In fact, yeah. Yeah. Fire fire. Right. Uh, the trucks downtown they carry anywhere from seven fifty to three thousand gallons. Of water. Oh wow. wow. So they're carrying about three times the water. Mm -hmm. um, with that, you gotta have the water is very. You know, it weighs about eight pounds of uh, a, a gallon. Mm -hmm. So you're talking about a lot of weight. That's why we have these big, big trucks. Right. Uh, and they're kind of made differently than your normal fire truck. And you've already pointed out, it kind of looks like a spaceship. But they're made to go off road because a lot of times airplanes don't crash on the runway. Mm -hmm. And we got to get out there in the woods. And so these have uh, locking differentials, it has six wheel drive wheels. I mean, this is. And they'll go anywhere you want to get out of the <laughs> yeah. really. And then put the fire out. It's amazing. So it's not amazing. only do we carry that much water, but we carry about, uh, I want to say, another additional 500 gallons of foam. And the machine, that's what we have here. Blue equals water, yellow equals foam, and 
purple is our extinguishing agent. So we have three different types of agents that we can put fire out with. Water by itself is not really useful on a, on a fuel fire, but it can do because um, the machine will actually mix the water and the foam together and they'll squirt out the nozzle, out the nozzle you're just looking at. Mm -hmm. And then also with this, um, that purple button there, there's a nitrous bottle in there, it's full of nitrogen gas, and it's a propellant. So when you turn on that propellant, it activates that extinguisher, just like you have at home. But this is purple K, it's potassium chloride. So what it does is when you shoot it out, you get fired with it, it actually bakes on the object that's on fire and it causes a crust. Mm -hmm. And when it causes that crust, it releases potassium chloride. And then that will snuff out the fire. So that purple K stuff, we call it purple K. Uh, um, it's really neat stuff. Uh, and you can shoot foam, water, and purple K all at the same time. ARF trucks are constructed very differently than regular old city fire trucks. ARF trucks must be able to travel off-road to a potential plane crash site. ARF trucks are also equipped to carry larger amounts of water as well as foam and chemicals to smother a fuel fire. Water alone isn't effective in putting out an airplane fire because airplane fires are generally fuel fires. When water alone is put onto a fuel fire, the fire will spread. Additional agents, like foam, similar to what you find in your fire extinguisher at home, and chemicals like potassium chloride are needed to put out these fires quickly and safely. When potassium chloride is sprayed onto an airplane, it creates a hard crust, similar to a scab that might form over a scrape. This prevents the fire from receiving oxygen and suffocates the fire quickly. The airplane that took off a few minutes ago that we watched, he mm -hmm. took off on runway 27. We have two pavement surfaces that are 90 degrees, uh, opposed uh, in nine, a 90 degree um, So they're perpendicular to each other. Yes. That's one of the words our students are using. So, um, <laughs> Love it. Those two pieces of pavement make up four runways. Okay. You've got one runway to the north, one runway to the south, one to the east, and one to the west. So you've got runway 18, runway 36, runway 9, runway 27. Okay. The way they come up with the runway names is you add a zero. Runway 27 is 270 degrees due west. Okay. Runway 9 is 90 degrees due east. Runway 18 is 180 degrees due south. And runway 36 is 360 degrees due north. Oh, awesome. So it's not nearly as complicated as everybody thinks. <laughs> Tallahassee Ground, Airport 5. Tallahassee Ground. Yes, sir, Airport 5 on the RF Access Road. Uh, Holding short of uh, holding short of, of uh, taxiway Bravo here. Like to reposition out to the uh, or Bravo Nine. Like to reposition out and hold short of runway Nine or in a quick trip down the runway. Airport Five reposition as requested. Airport Five as requested. Okay, so that's the ground controller. He's the frequency he's on is one twenty one point nine. The tower controller is on a different frequency. He's on 118.7, so that you don't get conversations mixed up. And they're both located in the These tower. Are, they're both they that you're coming up to an active runway. And then you have to call in again and mm -hmm. to request entry so, onto this. Right. We'll switch over to runway uh, over to the tower controller here. Tower Airport Five holding short a niner for an airfield inspection. Airport 
Niner, proceed on and down runway Niner. Uh, Airport 5 proceeding on and down runway 9. Okay, so you see the, the, uh, the aviation markings out here. Mm -hmm. We've got center line lights that are white. Okay. We have um, edge markings that are white. That tells an aircraft from the air that this is runway 9. Gotcha. Then so you've got the, the center line degree. here. They try to line up on the center line. And then the aiming point is right, these big square markers right here, they're a thousand feet down the runway. So this is what the aircraft is aiming for when they try to land. This is where they want their tires to go That's where they want to touch down. Okay. See the big six? Yes. That tells the pilot there's 6,000 feet left on the runway. Okay. You'll see it down to five, four, three, and so on. You can see the runway or the rubber on the center line here where aircraft land and lose rubber. And if you look to the side here, you'll notice that the runway has got grooves in it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Those grooves are to create friction on the tires of the aircraft so that they can... 51 picked up the runway about 800 feet. So they, so can, 51, right? they can maintain directional control of the aircraft. So okay. when it's wet like this, they just don't start skidding around. They're able to maintain uh, control of the aircraft. safety. We have a safety area that extends 250 feet from the center line to each side and a thousand feet off of each end that has to be maintained in a manner that if an aircraft runs off the runway, it's not going to cause damage to the aircraft. There can't be any holes, any ruts, anything of that nature. All these signs are what's referred to as frangible. You can see the 27 here because that's runway 27 going this direction. Gotcha which means if an aircraft were to hit any of these lights or any of these signs, they're designed to shear off so that they don't cause much damage to the aircraft. Tower Airport 5 is clear of runway 9. Airport 5, Roger. Ground Airport 5 with you on the east end of Taxiway Bravo. Like to reposition back to the terminal ramp, please. Airport 5, reposition on terminal ramp via Bravo. Airport 5 via Bravo. Okay, so when you talk to the tower, you state your request. Mm -hmm. They'll give you your instructions. He told me to go via Taxiway Bravo. You repeat that back to him so that you both know that you understand what the communication is. Another safety issue. Runway 9 is 90 degrees due east. Runway 18 is 180 degrees due south. Runway 27 is 207 degrees due west. And runway 36 is 360 degrees due north. If you land on a runway that is labeled runway 10, this would mean that the runway is positioned at 100 degrees northeast. The runways at Tallahassee International Airport are 8,000 feet and 7,000 feet long. To help you understand how long that is, remember there are 5,280 feet in a mile. The longer runway is about a mile and a half long. We hope you learned a lot about the Tallahassee International Airport and all the safety procedures that they take to make sure that you stay safe when you fly. Also, remember it's important if you're sending off a weather balloon at your school to make sure that you issue a notum to make sure that those airplanes in the air stay safe as well. If you'd like to learn more about your local airport, go ahead and visit the airport with your family and talk to some people who work there. You can watch the planes take off and you can watch them land. 
Next time you fly, ask the flight attendant questions and see if you can get to talk to the pilot before or after the flight. Take a field trip with your class. Most airports would love to have schools come and visit. Lastly, visit your local fire station. There's lots of wonderful things that your local fireman can show you. You can look around the trucks and see some pretty awesome stuff. We hope you're enjoying the day. Stay tuned for some more awesome weather balloon information.